If I turn on the sound, do you hear me better? Let me see if that's fine. Okay. I tend to talk fast, and so if I go too fast, slow me down. I want to stop with enough time for questions. But I plan to do about 45 minutes of showing you some things, and if you have questions, ask to go along. Just raise your hand or interrupt me. Okay? Please be welcome to do that. Um, I'm Father Jim Olka, and I actually grew up here in Grand Island. I'm one of 10 children. My mom and dad still live here in town. I was ordained a priest 24 years ago, right here at this cathedral. Fifty-one years ago, in that white font right there that, that, that is open. When I was baptized, a Catholic baptistry is traditionally in the doorway, the entryway of the church, because baptism is the way to come into the community. And so, to my chagrin, but because we need it, what was the baptistry is now a bathroom. <laughs> so I don't feel very good about that. <laughs> I do want to tell you some history some architecture and art that's here. And you can't come in a church without talking about some spirituality and some theology also. So I'm not trying to proselytize anything, but uh, the reason a church exists is because of our faith. So maybe first a couple of comments about why we build churches the way that we do in our Christian tradition, and especially in our Roman Catholic tradition. The center of our church is Jesus Christ. So any church, and it's interesting, it may be unfortunate, that the word we use for the community that gathers together is the same word we use for the building. So the church gathers inside of the church. Or people say, I'm going to church. They have to be in a service of some kind. Um, for us, the church is first the body of Christ, the people. And we started naming these buildings we gather in the church. The early Christian churches were patterned after the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, they had a cylinder. began to make their churches look like Roman basilicas. Um, after time, they evolved. But one thing, of course, about any Catholic church is that the church is trying to proclaim to us something about the person of Jesus Christ. And we know that Christ is what we call transcendent. He is divine. And in our faith, he also became human. So he's also imminent. So when you walk into a Catholic church, we say the right response is not Oh, I like this, or who I eat this. The proper response is, what is this church saying about Jesus? And so when you walk into this church, this church emphasizes, of course, the transcendence of Jesus. He is divine. So everything about the arches and the vault ceiling naturally draws your eyes up. When I came out of our sacristy and looked at myself, 20 of you and 18 of you were going like this. <laughs> so there's a sense that there's a spiritual longing to do this. This. And that's something beyond in our faith is God who loves us. Uh, Christ who wants to save us. And so we have a yearning for whatever is beyond. And that's why our eyes are on the world. So when you come into a church, that's the only thing that happens. I was baptized here when I was four years old, and I lived up two new Catholic churches. So when I was born in the Blessed Sacrament of St. Mary's Cathedral were the two churches. In about 1970, they built two more St. Thales and Resurrection. I grew up in St. Leo's. If you've ever been in St. Leo's Catholic Church, it started as a church that we called the Ground. So wherever we sat, we saw the other people, and the altar was in the middle. So that church discusses the imminence of Jesus, that Jesus became human. So that church we see other human beings. So which one is right and which one is wrong? They're both right. right? So they're both trying to proclaim something about Jesus. So that's the first thing to say about why we build our churches the way we do. This church is designed after uh, a church in Paris called uh, Saint Chapel, which means the Holy Chapel. And uh, one of our parishioners, my family, was just there a week or two ago. And when this church was built, construction began in 1926. The bishop at the time, Bishop Dudley, told the architects, "I want this church to look like Saint Chapel in Paris." Saint Chapel is just down a little ways from Notre Dame on the Isle of Saint. It's about four times as big as this church. But if you look at it both from the outside, you can see the exact same architectural design. <coughs> so if you do a Google search for that, you'll see what's the origin here. Um, a little history that I'll read to you. We have a Paul County Historical Society. Anybody know what year Paul County was established by an act of legislation? 
when you have something to establish by an act of legislation. 1806, 1855, and then organized in 1859. So it took about four years to organize after it was established. Well, that same year in 1859, two brothers, Patrick and Richard Moore, moved here from Iowa City. And as far as we can tell, they were the first Catholics in Paul County. They lived three miles west of Wood River, what is Wood River today. And I love this because these two brothers came out from Iowa. They settled. There were no Catholic priests within 150 miles. They called the nearest bishop, who was in Omaha, and they said, hey, you got Catholics coming out here in Hall County. Send us a priest. And the bishop said, I'll see what I can do. And he found the nearest priest in Columbus, and that priest would come here about once a month to celebrate Mass with those two brothers and their family. And so then eventually, over time, the community began to grow a little bit bigger. And when the railroad was developed here, the railroad actually donated land to St. Mary's Cathedral um, to build their first church. That was in 1869. And the first church was built on the corner of, I think my bearing is correct here, on the corner of First Street and Elm Street. So almost opposite here on the other corner. And the first church that they tried to build, they barely got it up, and then I think a windstorm came and knocked it down. The second one they tried to build, the depression hit, and it stopped all building, and that eroded. And the third one that they built, let's see what years that would have been, in 1877, the members of the church began for the third time to rebuild. The cornerstone was laid on May 7th, the building completed in July, and dedicated in September of that same year, which was a very quick time. It was a frame structure with a good brick foundation, and at that time the congregation numbered about 30 families. Um, Father Richard Phelan came here in 1880, and he was kind of the first pastor. He found 52 families serving here at that time. Um, eventually, yeah. Was the third church? Was that also a first canal? Correct. And so the, the, the third church at the corner of First and Elm um, was the brick structure that had two spiders on it. Some of you might remember that. It was red, very correct. And when they stopped using that church, they realized that uh, they needed a bigger space. And the bishop had a huge dream. At the time, people thought this was ludicrous. Why spend that much money building something this big for so few families? <coughs> well, I just finished our fourth service this, of today. I have one more yet tonight. We had one here last night. And probably 3,000 people have been in here this weekend for services. So we could use a bigger church. Um, the last one we had to do was our Spanish mass, and there were people standing all on the wall. So we wish it was a little bigger. Um, when they began to build this church in 1926, I can't imagine how they did it. We do have three parishioners who are already into 90. And one of them remembers being in first grade at the old St. Mary's School, watching them put up the limestone walls. And so they can remember them going to 1926 and 27. July of 1928 is when the church was dedicated, July 5th, and at that time it cost $350,000 to build this structure. So to build this today, I don't know what it cost. But I did a, I just signed a contract for $1.1 million to replace the heating and air conditioning here. So what the structure would cost, I'm not sure. Um, after they built this church, then they continued to use the old cathedral on the corner for use with the school. So there was a great school, high school here on the corner, and they converted that building, and we call that a deconsecration. So anytime we start with a new church, we consecrate it for holy use. That means that now there's something different about this space. When we come here, we turn everything towards God, and anything that happens here, we want to be worthy of God. So once we stop using a church, there's a ritual of deconsecration that says now it's going to be used for something else. What they used it for, they had plans in the gymnasium. Uh, many of the boys and girls play basketball in there. Um, there was also a social club in the basement for a while. And they eventually had to pull that down. Okay. Um, I, I said I was baptized here. I went to first and second grade in the old St. Mary's grade school that was right across the street here when Division Street used to go through. And I remember when the bishop at the time had to close either Semper Catholic High School or the two grade schools. 
one year in one blessed sacrament, and he decided to close the grade school so he came to junior high high school. So after I finished second grade, I was home at my mom and dad's house down by Sally Park, crying my eyes out because the bishop closed our school. Um, that school remained then for a while to serve the parish as a parish hall. And it was uh, an old building and very difficult to have much to do. So eventually they tore down that building about 20 years ago and constructed the current Cathedral Square. Now back to this church. A couple of notes. Again. Probably one of the best elements of this church, I think, is the we call it Rose Lou, or the Sea Glass Lou, or the Sand And most of our people miss it because they're all looking the other way during Mass. I get to enjoy the wind by the people during Mass. But I'm trying to find a history of where this is where came from. We know that it's from the Church of Southern Italy. It was transported over here sometime in the early 1920s to be put into this church here. So I don't know what church it came out of. There's a story that when uh, the bishop it. He talked about going to the ship and getting free over here. And then he got a charter some years to buy to the port to take them right back to here for free. So I don't know how he felt that. And then he got to install the gas box. But then he comes to the middle of the center. You see Mary holding the child Jesus in her arms. If you look above Mary, there's a dove. That's the smoke of the Holy Spirit. And above the dove, you see a man holding his arms out. So our tradition is God the Father, the God is God the Holy Spirit, and the Mary is holy Jesus, God the Son, so the Trinity. And as, as Catholics, that we honor Mary, we do not worship Mary. Mary is not God. But Mary had an important role in allowing the Son of God to be born in incarnation. And so at the time, this church was named after Mary, and not only that, it was named after the birthday of Mary. So the official name of our church is the Nativity of the, the Nativity of the, well, the Cathedral of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we celebrate her birthday. And in our church calendar, we only celebrate the birthdays of three people. One is Mary on September 8th. One is John the Baptist on June 22nd, 23rd. And the other one is Jesus Christ on December 25th. Now, do we really know if Mary was born on September 8th? No. But we think it's important that we honor that day just to mark that event. And so this church carries her name. We call St. Mary's Cathedral. Um, a unique part about this window also is that if you look at the, there's a rows of saints on both sides of Mary. Below the person is the name of the saint. And any of the saints that are listed there are from the Roman church, but also from the Eastern Orthodox church. Like Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. So those are part of the Christian world, a little separate from the Roman writers, which we'll be celebrating here. So it's really good to that they include saints from all over the world. So that would be very inclusive. Okay? Next thing I would go for you is the artwork that's in here. I'm sure there's a piece of that. I can't imagine all the people. She said yes to the burying of Jesus in her, 
and gave birth to Jesus, the Son of God. So she did her willing yes to that. And in our tradition, because Mary was so honored that at her death, she was assumed into heaven. So there's something unique about her. So this baby is trying to depict that um, she's not in a grave, you can see the sarcophagus below, rather she's rising into heaven. And Del Greco, one of the marks of his paintings is he thinks it's very important for Christians to not just sit around and worship, but to go out and tell the world about the good news of Jesus. And so in this painting, what strikes me is Mary's being raised up to heaven. And if you look at all the disciples below, none of them are looking at her. They're all looking at each other and telling them about it. Now, if you are with someone who had just Way to pass. All of a sudden, started elevating off the earth and going up into the heavens. I would be like this. And instead, these guys are telling the whole world about this event because that was important for them. So we have to get out and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of what's happening in that image. On this side, this is the, the many people who believe this is the final painting that Raphael painted, um, the great Italian painter. They found this um, on his death. I say some of the students might have finished it. Um, this painting depicts uh, two biblical stories that happen in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew. And it depicts the transfiguration of Jesus. So Jesus is up on the mountain with James and John and Peter, and he was transfigured in their sight. And appeared at his side Moses and Elijah. So in the center is Jesus, Moses is right, carrying the Ten Commandments, and God is on the left as a prophet, and below them you see the disciples kind of shielding their eyes from all of this. If you look where we're on the left, there's a couple of eyes from the tiny little bush over there. This painting was supposed to go into a small country church in Italy, and those are two global saints from that small church in Italy, so we included them in it to help that local community. Well then, after the Transfiguration, and if you remember that biblical story, Peter said, that we're here, we should build some tents and stay here forever. And what did Jesus say? No, we must go down the mountain. I have to go to Jerusalem where the Son of Man is going to be arrested, suffer, and die, and then be raised again. So they come down the mountain. Does anybody remember the scene that they found when they came down the mountain? They go Mark and then Matthew. The disciples, the other nine disciples, were with a man whose son was possessed. And the other nine disciples were trying to free the demon out of that possessed boy, and they could not do it. And Jesus came down, and he immediately did it. So if you look on the bottom right, you see the man in the green? That's the father, and he's holding his boy, who's got the shirt off, he's kind of screaming. Um, the biggest difference of the painting, the whole top is an elephant light and brightness, because when you put your eyes on Christ, it's going to be bright. And then at the bottom is the disciples trying to do it themselves. And if you try to go it alone without Christ, it's hard. And you say, so far in the painting is trying to show that. You notice the, the bottom left, there's a guy holding a book. Um, on Raphael painted this, he had Matthew's version in mind. So the belief is that that's Matthew who's writing down the event. And then just to the left of the man and the boy, you see kind of a woman being. So she's not one of the twelve disciples that's laying wisdom. Bible wisdom is presided by the woman. And so, like, this wisdom is there to try to point people back to Christ. And even if you look at Christ's left foot, his left foot kind of points right down at the boy, like he's all about knowing his point, he's all he's going to go there. I don't know why the pastor chose these two paintings in 1950 to put up. I can't imagine what it would take to do that today. Um, but the pastor gave a devotion to these at the time. Um, or maybe they're willing to be this one is located in the Vatican City, the original one. One note about our churches too, then, when you walk into a church, we have paintings and we have statues. And so why do we do that? Sometimes people say, well, Catholics worship statues, and that's why they put them there. That's not true. Like I said, when you walk into a church, you ought to get a sense of who Jesus is. And the other sense is that people come into a church seeking God, we believe. And in our celebration of the Eucharist of the Mass, we really believe that we get to participate in heaven in some way. So when people walk into churches, we want to help them get a glimpse of what heaven might look like. 
So if you're in heaven, who else is going to be there? I assume Jesus, the Father, Son, and Spirit. I assume the saints. I assume Mary. <laughs> so churches tend to put statues around as ways to help us understand that we have brothers and sisters that are with us. We don't worship these statues. They help us. They're also a good way to tell our story. In the Middle Ages, churches used many stained glass windows because many people were illiterate. So it was very easy. I love um, the Feast of the Transfiguration to walk down here and just tell the people about that story. Because people are like, oh, I get it. You know, we learn better by sight sometimes instead of a 30 minute sermon time. So we can use them to learn. In our church, to this side, we have two statues. The one on the right is St. Francis of Assisi, one of our most beloved saints. And St. Francis of Assisi, you normally see in your garden because he loved animals. And the story is that when people stopped listening to him, he would love to preach to the animals. And when the animals would listen to him. Dr. Strike Foot, can you tell us in the middle of the bottom? He has a skull. Why does St. Francis of Assisi have a skull? Memento Mori. Memento Mori. It's important that the brothers continually think about and pray about the moment of their own life. So if God created us to be here forever, there would be no death. But there is death, so apparently God created us for something else. And so this is to get us ready for that. So on one hand, Christians should be experts on death. Because we have God committed to it on the cross, we shouldn't be afraid of it. So St. Francis would carry around with the soul. Put it on the dinner table so that the brothers would make it up. I don't know which school it was. Um, but it's a way to remember that um, we're all going to die. So if no one told you that, it's all right to be one of these And then on the left over there is another St. Francis, St. Francis de Sales. And he's one of the doctors of our church, Dr. Meaning of uh, Intelligence. He wrote a book called The Devout Life. And if you want a book that has a simple chapter, so very practical information on the spiritual life, um, the devout life is a good one. So you see him holding his book and kind of reading it. And so for him, um, he's one of our doctors in the church we call it. I want to look at this statue up here on the front left. St. Anthony of Padua is the, the brown Franciscan friar, and he's holding the baby Jesus. Um, he's often depicted holding the baby Jesus. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. On his deathbed, he had an image of Jesus coming to him as a child uh, in a very tender way, and just sitting with him until he passed. Uh, there's another thing. He's holding a Bible and for the Franciscans to preach the gospel at all times was important. And you preach it especially by your actions. And you preach it by especially just introducing people to Jesus. So if you see him holding open the Bible, what he's trying to do is to tell people who Jesus is. over here is the image of our lady Guadalupe. So she was not original to this church as one of the two Franks or St. Francis's. Um, then about 20 years ago, the Hispanic community started growing with our cathedral church. And our lady Guadalupe is a miracle that happened in Mexico City and is a, a source of great strength for the Hispanics. And in our church, she's called the mother of the Americans. She appeared at a time in Mexico's history when things were very, very late. The poor and the oppressed. She appeared to a very poor person to live in the sky. So um, I think it's very fitting that we can get into the front here and our Hispanic community lives there. The lighting of candles for us is a tradition that many Christian churches have, and it's a way of um, just asking my prayer to continue after I've left here. So I, I, I light a candle and I feel that my prayer intention is still being offered to God. My intention might be my grandma needs help. Might be, I need help, or I might be, thank you, God, for this blessing I see. And so the candles are like big long candles they burn for me, and we like that here in the church. Um, two other statues that I want to note. Um, on this side, on the far right, I would like to see Joseph. Joseph, the uh, husband of Mary, the stepfather of Jesus. And we don't know much about St. Joseph. Um, we don't know when he died or how he died, but we know he accepted Mary though he probably didn't understand why she was pregnant when they were engaged, and somehow he knew God's will. And part of the theory is 
is that uh, St. Joseph's staff got turned into a lily when he accepted Christ to be raised as his own son. So he's holding a lily in his right hand. It's a symbol of St. Joseph. St. Joseph is the worker, so he's a painter of all those who work. And then on this side is an image of Mary, and this is called the Immaculate Conception of Mary. I'm going to walk you around in a minute and take to note is that at her feet, where the flowers are, she's standing on a serpent. She's standing on a snake. And she's doing that because of the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. So the book of Genesis, the snake came and tricked Eve. And then in the book of Revelation, the woman appeared stepped on the serpent's head, which is Satan, and defeated him. So we believe that that person is uh, Mary, so she corrected what Eve had messed up for us, Adam and Eve. So you often see a snake at her feet. So I love teaching about that also. Um, the last statue here on the top right is Jesus, and it's called the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It's a tradition in our church that Christ opens his heart to him to all of us. Um, I want to walk you around and see a few more things, but around for a moment. Anything else bring a question to your life? Well, years ago, the people who were in the room painted and touched up at that time, they were right on So they didn't bring someone special to try to clean them. We had to add especially the lines around them. Yeah, As someone noted that the stained glass windows on the sides were not finished. So at the time they built the church, they didn't have enough money for those. And at the time, if you wanted the cardinal, who was one of the leaders of our church, to come and consecrate your church, had to be debt free. So the church was debt free on July 5th of 1928. Cardinal Hayes of New York City came all the way here and consecrated this church. Um, my plan is to, I just want to take one of those panels and put in an image. Because if you do one, then you got to finish them all someday. Right? I don't know how much money that would cost. Um, and then, you can't see from this side, but if you're around the outside of the church looking at the back side, there are three kind of names when they had intended to have stained glass windows when they built the church. And they did have enough money to do that, so they packed it in. And then they put the ball of the candle here. We'll talk about that when we walk out here. Yes. 
Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogy of Jesus. So human persons are important. And by the way, these four symbols come from the book of um, the prophet Ezekiel, where he has an image of these four human persons, all with different characteristics. And so the church eventually developed those as symbols for the four evangelists. Back here is one of the angels. This is the guardian angel. And in our worship, we believe the angels are here watching over us and with us to protect us and help us give proper praise to God. So if you can kind of see the human person below, straight up from where my finger is where you see the name Matthew. Okay. And then from this side in front, this says St. Mark. And can you see the image that's right above the name Mark? What is it? You saw it? It's a lion. Now, the lion is there for St. Mark because in St. Mark he begins with the prophet Isaiah, with St. John using Isaiah's words. Isaiah was like a lion from Judah. So, um, the beginning of St. Mark's Gospel uses that image. So, that's why St. Mark is here. And then over here, we have St. Luke. You can move back this way if you like. And what's the animal for St. Luke? Ox. An ox. At the beginning of St. Luke's Gospel, there's a story of Zechariah who was a priest in the temple, and his job was to sacrifice animals like the ox. So that's why the ox is a symbol for St. Luke. And of course, around the other side would be the final evangelist, St. John. And can anybody see what's the symbol for John that's up there? It's an eagle. St. John's Gospel is different than the other three. He has kind of soaring theology. Instead of the birth of Jesus, he begins philosophical. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So an eagle kind of soars high. Um, so that's why that is there. So in our tradition, we're a Bible church. We are also what we call a sacramental church. So we believe God's word is known through the proclamation of the Bible and the celebration of our sacraments. The table right here that we're all around is our altar. And the Jewish faith, they would bring an animal to the altar. They would sacrifice it and then say, Hey okay, God, now be nice to us and give us food. So it's like you're trying to get God's attention. With Jesus Christ, it would change. Now Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. And that's why we have an image of him on the cross. And he said, I'm going to sacrifice myself, so don't kill animals anymore. I don't want that kind of sacrifice. What I want is your heart to pursue. And so the altar now is instead of a place where we sacrifice animals like our Jewish ancestors did, it's a place where we remember the one sacrifice Jesus did for us. So in a sense, this is our parish and family. For us, it's also Jesus. So when the priest comes in to begin Mass, the first thing he does is offer this. And then this is called an info. This church used to have a, a very elaborate one. I don't remember if it went off from here and went out to the people. It was about 12, 15 feet off the ground. So the days before electricity, you could be elevated and then speak down and everybody could hear you. And we've been trying to find that one. Some church in Kansas has what we think, the original. But now, because of the Christian, we can use this. So this is the animal that we proclaim the Word of God for. Um, and our music here is over here. I'd like to walk you into our sacristy, if that's okay. But any questions from here that you can see? Why does some church in Kansas have your pulpit? 
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> when did it go? Yeah, so when the church was um, probably about 1970. Oh, the 70s. Yeah. So they, when they put an altar, they put an ambo, and then they, and I think it was kind of unsturdy at the time, to be honest. So instead of refixing it up, at that time we had uh, electricity and they didn't need it anymore. Sold it to some other church. That I believe so. Right. Yeah. Not fall off. Um, if you look back against the wall on the top right, you see a little gold box back up there? There's a cross in the middle that says, Olea Santa. So in our church, we use holy oils that are blessed by our bishop once a year. Those oils we use for some of our prayers. And that's where the old ones used to be kept. And it's a funny place to put them because they're really hard to get to, right? And I think that's because they wanted them to be safe and only used for proper use. Uh, today, we keep them in the sacristy and cabinet, and they're just a the safe idea. Anything else you wonder about here? Are they ever used for baptisms? The only sometimes? They are. Yep. Is that so the only time or we, have, we have three different kinds of oils. One of them is called chrism. It's the sweet smelling one. We use that for baptisms, for confirmations, and for ordinations. And then the second one is for the anointing of the sick. So if somebody is ill, you can pray over them. Like we see in the epistle St. James, the elders laid hands over them and anointed them with oil. And the third one is called the oil of catechumens. And you can use that for people who are entering the church to pray for protection. Okay. And we also use that oil of catechumens at the baptism as well to pray for protection for this child from anything evil. Anybody know the symbolism of a, a lamb below the tabernacle? So it says Anus Dei, which is Lamb of God, one of the images of Jesus. And below the lamb, there are seven scrolls. Anybody know why it's a nation Anybody know their book of Revelation? So the book of Revelation, the lamb that was slain appears, and the seven scrolls were opened to reveal God's plan. We believe Jesus is that plan. On the left is the Greek letter for Alpha, and on the right is the letter for Omega. So everything about that altar is about Jesus. And then the dove right above the tabernacle is the one thing that is the Holy Spirit coming down on Jesus. The, most of this marble came from Italy, and our current bishop is trying to create a new altar and ambo made from marble. If you look too closely, you'll see there's at least three different kinds of marble used here. And so there's one here, one here, and one here. And so if we make a new altar and ambo from marble, we have to decide kind of which one to use. Um, when they built this even, to try to imagine building this Baldacchino with this kind of heft um, back in the early 1920s is amazing to me. I'm sorry for so much theology and spirituality, but that's who we are. On the both sides, we often kneel here. On both sides here, we have little containers that have slots in them. One tradition in our churches, in the early Christian churches, they would keep relics of saints. And a relic could be part of the bone, part of some clothing, part of their hair, if they had hair. And uh, especially the early church kept the relics of martyrs, because people died for their faith, and it was a way to try to help people realize that uh, hey, we're all in this together and there's some support. People have died for this and they're here with us. So many times the altars, at one time they had to have a relic in them. So this one has six different uh, relics, and they're pretty obscure saints. So not anybody might know that. On the inside uh, of the uh, golf, you know, is there those are uh, mosaics? It, uh, it is a mosaic, yeah. So we just put these two spotlights in there about oh, four months ago. So I was up there looking at some of the mosaic, and there used to be a chandelier hanging down from there that would have lighted this whole place from Mass was set from here. Um, so we tried to just bring some light back to it because there's a lot of shadows in this big church. I'd also say that about uh, one month ago, I climbed with our maintenance man on the catwalk above the ceiling. And I would not recommend that. <laughs> and I didn't tell my mom and dad about it. <laughs> but to get there, there's a, a thin ladder that you get up behind the left side organ uh, blowers, and you have to climb all the way up on this ladder, and the, the area is about this wide as well. And then when you get to the top, you have to crawl on your hands and knees on the curve. Then you get to the very top, there's a catwalk about three feet off the ground. It's about this wide and there's no railing on it. So you're just walking 
Whoa. I made to replace uh, this light bulb right over here. So I was I was holding on to the catwalk while my maintenance guy was down there changing it. It's a long way to confess their sins. Do they need to go to the priest to be forgiven? No. But something really happens that helps us when we can go to another person and say our sins together. And a priest is bound by whatever he hears there. So I see some of my parishioners here. If they, if they told me their sins in there, I could never say them outside of there. And in fact, God blesses me to forget them all. So I don't remember anything anybody tells me in there. Which is a gift of our faith. You can take a couple more steps this way, if you don't mind. I thought we'd have ten people here today, so this is great. <laughs> <coughs> There's no speaker in here, so I'll try to speak up. This is simply a sacristy, a working area where the priests and ministers gather beforehand to celebrate Mass. Um, in the morning, we have Mass at 7 o'clock every morning, and we have uh, two deacons and a retired priest who will gather here to say morning prayer after they unlock the church. Um, these are the vestments that we wear at the Mass. Um, this vestment is, in the Roman Empire, this is what a man would wear around the house or like if he was around town visiting friends. It's called an alb. Anybody know Latin? What does alb mean in Latin? Very fancy word, it means white. <laughs> so they weren't very creative when they named this. So we put this on first as we, for any of our um, celebrations. And then on top of that, we would place two other items. This is called a stole. And a stole is a symbol for the priesthood. So he kisses it and places it over here. And it looks like a yoke. Like you put oxen in a yoke. And one of the images that we have is that this means that we proclaim God's word. And it also means that now I'm yoked to Christ. So whatever I do from this point on, I do whatever he asks me to do. So I can't just make this stuff up. So I, I now work on his behalf. Um, so the, the head priest of this church is Christ, and then we serve for him. And then on top of all that, we place another vestment. This is called a chasuble, which in Latin means little house. And the image is that this represents all of the people of the parish. So I, I put this on top because I put on all of the prayers of the people. So if you think about what a priest does during Mass, he's doing it on behalf of Christ, on behalf of his people. So there's nothing about gym in it. It's all about trying to serve the people. Our air conditioning is very poor here. So if you've been here in the summertime for a wedding or for something, um, after every mass with all these vestments on, I change every article of clothing I have. <laughs> it's a good way to lose weight, I guess. And they're different colors for different seasons. Correct, yep. So we don't, we don't just decide which color is my favorite, but depending on the time of the church year that we're in. So right now we're in what's called ordinary time. So this was the 32nd Sunday of Ordinary Time. And ordinary doesn't mean not extraordinary. It's the Latin ordinal meaning to count. So we're counting the days. In many Protestant churches, it'd be, I don't remember the day, but like the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. It's just another way of counting. And then pretty soon, once December comes, sorry camera, then we'll put on purple for the season of Advent as we're getting ready for Christmas. And the color white we wear for our best celebrations, which would be baptisms, Easter, Christmas, um, and also on the day of our funeral. Because the day of our funeral is um, a day of Easter for us also. And then this is where our deacons' vestments would be, and those are a little bit different than the priests. And the altar servers wear the cassock and surplus over there. When I first arrived here two and a half years ago, the parish had just had a hailstorm. And this whole ceiling was damaged here and all the way through here. And there was a big tarp right here coming down, collecting water in a bucket. And the ceiling just was non-existent. And I walked in and the, the former pastor was showing me around and he said, Welcome, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank God for insurance and good people who helped to get it all repaired again. But 90-year-old buildings have that. So the parish has been here more than 90 years with this particular structure for 90 years, so we celebrated that. There is a hidden passage in this room. Um, could someone open the left cabinet there, if you, if you dare? Then you have to open the other door that's in there. You might knock first to make sure no one's in there. <laughs> There's a bathroom. <laughs> You can open the door so you can see in there. 
<laughs> you can leave it open. <laughs> so um, you're all adults here, I can tell you the story, yeah? If you don't repeat it anywhere. <laughs> we had a funeral for a brother of an elderly priest visiting from another town, and he was here, and I've known him a long time, he said, Jim, I really have to go to the bathroom. And I said, well, we just go in that closet over there. <laughs> He looked at me and he walked over and opened the door and said, oh, ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> so we're human too, yeah. <laughs> on the top right are some of the ritual books that we use. Um, so depending on what the celebration is. I mentioned the oils. They're on the far left one over here. And they're just small. Um, would you hold up one of those for us? Yeah, they're just very small containers of oil. And they're all marked for the different uses of them. So if we have a baptism, we're always using those. Uh, anointing sick. Um, let me stop there. Yeah. Can you explain the red vestments? The red vestments that we have, we use for one of two celebrations. One is a celebration of the Holy Spirit. So that could be Pentecost Sunday. It could also be a confirmation. So confirmation for us is a coming of the Holy Spirit upon a young person uh, or a not-so-young person. And it also could be the red can represent the blood of a martyr or the blood of Christ. So on Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday, where we retell the story of his dying, we wear red. On Good Friday, the day of his death, we wear red. And then like uh, St. James is a martyr, so on his feast day, we would wear red. So it's just another way of helping us to tell our story. Would that be on any uh, saint's feast day or on St. James? Um, any, fe any saint who's a martyr. So it could be there's a number of them, about a... You know, two, over 300 of them, but on the calendar, about 180, I think. Yeah. So this church, again, is named after Mary, so any Mary celebration, we can celebrate her birth, we can celebrate her annunciation, uh, we can celebrate you know, when the angel Gabriel came to her and said, you're going to have a baby, we celebrate that day nine months before Christmas, because nine months later she had the baby. Um, so all of that is just a way to tell our story um, throughout the whole year. And for us, the church year begins with the first Sunday of Advent, um, and so at that time we begin to tell the story of how the world's going to end and how Christ is going to be born. And how the world is going to end is something we're not afraid of. We call for Christ to come and set everything right. And we yearn for that. So even the, the phrase Maranatha means come Lord Jesus, come. And so one old priest told me, he said, you know what we do for Mass on Sunday morning? We get all the people together and we sit and we look and we wait to see if Jesus is going to come again. And then if it's 8 o'clock in the morning and he hasn't come yet, then we start Mass. <laughs> and then during Mass, he comes to us. But it's a way of just pre preparing daily for his coming. So we're, we're not afraid of that, but we do want to be prepared for that. Again, sorry for all the spirituality of that, but that's who we are, I guess. Any other questions? This is just a pathway behind the altar area? Correct. So that, that's a pathway that... Um, during the Mass, the altar servers use that often, so they'll, because they'll come over here to get things from here to carry back in and use at different parts of the service. Um, so one of my first weekends here, a little server was late, a little boy about this big, and he was supposed to be over here pretty quickly, and all I could hear was his footsteps just <laughs> running across there. Because then you can see right over that or hear over that from the other side. The other side is a room just like this room, um, and it was at one time a sacristy for the altar servers. So that's where the servers would be getting ready while the priests got ready over here as a way to separate that. And now we use it for our musicians. The music ministers are over there. Plus, it's one of the entrances to the church. Hmm. Below us, there is a basement. And that basement is where our thrift store is now. Uh, when I was in first and second grade, we had PE down there. So I remember being down there. And now we're replacing our boiler, which is 45 years old. And so we're, we're rebuilding that room. But it's directly below here. That's called Mary's Closet if you come in that way. And then right back through this doorway here, that walkway connects to the rectory, which is where we live. And on the way there to the left is a huge vault or a safe. And that's where we keep um, many of the kind of the relics and the traditional items that we use during Mass. So we don't use that for the money, but just for like the bishop's crozier would be there, historical items would be there. Um, on our 90th celebration anniversary, we brought most of that out and displayed it for the people to see. Um, then in another room back there is uh, where musicians keep some of their uh, 
one of our Spanish groups has a marimba that they play. And it's a man handmade marimba from Guatemala. So that's back in one of the rooms too. Um, and if anybody wants to see that when we're done, I can walk you around to those things. Then the rectory is where not only Father Scott and myself live, he's our associate pastor, it's also where our offices are. Um, and then our secretaries and the rest of the parish staff is across the way in the cathedral square, which is also the daycare. Uh, Kristen is one of our staff members here. She's a music minister, fairly new to us. Um, so she came and um, right away enjoyed the sound system for singing because the church is very good for that. And tell us about the organ, if you don't mind, because you were up in the organ. About it. <laughs> <laughs> a place you could crawl into? Yeah, so, well, I saw the pipes um, on the right side when you're facing that way, the right side. There's a, another door to get through, and then you have to crawl in to actually see it. So, I don't know, it was kind of cool <laughs> for me because, yeah, you know, I don't know much about the organ, but I try. So, twice a year, a man has to come and retune the organ, and so he's crawling into those pipes, and so that's an ancient um, instrument that we have to keep in shape and the weather affects it greatly. Mm -hmm. The cross right behind you is a processional cross, so we, we begin, we, there's two of them, we use one of them, depending on how big the altar server is. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we begin our service with a procession of the cross, so Christ is ahead of us as we all come in. And going out. And going out. Thanks, yeah. What else can I tell you? I was baptized in that font I mentioned to you, and here we have about 150 baptisms a year, um, so quite a number. And so it's always uh, striking for me to be there, thinking my mom and dad brought me here when I was two weeks old, back in 1966, and now I'm in the same font baptizing other children, and um, Christ is baptizing them, and I just get to be there. With them. So that's, that's a neat thing uh, to be here. I moved back here two and a half years ago, so as priests, we are ordained to a diocese. So I'm a priest of the Diocese of Grand Island. So I serve the diocese wherever the bishop sends us. So I served in Kearney, Alliance, Scotts Bluff. Recently, I was in North Platte for 10 years, and then he asked me to come back here. And I grew up at St. Leo's, so I said, well, can I go back to St. Leo's? And he said, no, you're going to the cathedral. So. <laughs> and in this parish, um, half of everything we do is in Spanish. So I try to speak Spanish, and so I enjoy that. Um, but it's a another challenge, an opportunity for the parish too. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'd like to, if anybody wants to, I'll show you one of our confessionals because people want to know what's in a Catholic confessional. Um, and then if you want to, um, you can look on the, on the entrance of the church to the far right as you're going out is where the baptistry used to be. And right now we're remodeling that to be a bathroom. So, and you can walk in there. It's one of the nicest bathrooms around. There's marble and tile and all sorts of things. Um, and you can tell that that room was an octagon-shaped room. So baptistries had eight sides to them. Anybody know why that is? It's another theological principle that the Lord, so God created the world in six days. And then on the seventh day, he rested. And then the eighth day, is the next day, which is in some ways the first day of the week again, so it's every Sunday, but the eighth day is also the end times when Jesus is going to come and put everything right. So when you're baptized, you participate in all of that. So baptistry is used eight sides to remember the beginning of the world, Christ's coming, and then Christ is going to come again. And now you belong to him, so you're going to be part of that. So that bathroom has eight sides to it. And then the church originally had two bathrooms in the basement, and probably 15 years ago, the men's room had caved in. The pipes had caved in. So that's why 20 years ago, they put two bathrooms upstairs that were kind of temporary. And just recently, we remodeled the whole basement um, and added well, about six men's rooms and about seven for the women. Um, and so that's also the bridal preparation area. So we don't have a lot of gathering space here. Um, but the, if you're going to walk to the basement and just see our bathrooms, you're welcome to do that too. Um, and the narthex is the entryway of the church. And churches traditionally had an in-between space. So you don't go right from outside to right in the worship area. There has to be an in-between place because it's kind of like a place of transition. Like I'm moving from my concerns of where I was and I'm getting ready to turn my vision to God now. And so that in-between place here is fairly small. 
that it's significant. So then when you open the other door and come in, now you're ready to worship. There's a holy water font by each of our doors, and that's to help us remember we're baptized. So I was two weeks old, I don't remember it, so I put my hand in and I remember that I belong to Christ. It's also a way of receiving a blessing. Um, also, Catholics do calisthenics during Mass, right? <laughs> so we stand, we sit, we kneel, and just very briefly, those, uh, those postures all mean something. So when we walk into a church, we bless ourselves with holy water. Parents will bless their children. Um, I love Hispanics. Like if uh, I love the spirituality. If one is good, 20 is better. <laughs> so they bless themselves like 20 times all over their body just to put Christ everywhere on them. And then they do the same with their children. Then we walk into a church, and then you look to see where the tabernacle is, um, a presence of Christ, or the altar, or the crucifix, and then normally we genuflect. And that's just going down on one knee, and we'll oftentimes make the sign of the cross. Um, in the Middle Ages, if you came across another king, you would genuflect in front of him and lower your neck. So you literally gave him your neck. And if he wanted to let you walk in his kingdom, he would let you stand up and walk. And if not, so we don't, we don't accept the violent part of that. But it is a reminder to us that this is God's kingdom, not mine. And so when I walk in, I genuflect to say, God, this is your world, and I get to live in it. So thank you for that. And then during the Mass, we stand whenever you're about to meet Christ. So we stand at the beginning because the cross is coming in with the ministers and the book. We stand to hear the gospel because Jesus is talking to us. And I think if Jesus was going to talk to me, I wouldn't just sit there and say, hey. I would stand up and be attentive. And we also stand up to receive Holy Communion. So every time we stand, we're getting ready to meet the Lord somehow. And then sitting is the posture of a student who's learning. So we sit during the sermon or the homily and during those times. I was preparing a couple for marriage. She's Catholic and he's Lutheran. And they went to a movie together. And they got there a little late, so the lights were already down. And she's leading the way down the ramp, looking for a place. And she sees a place and she automatically genuflects. <laughs> and the man was walking behind her and didn't see her genuflect. And he just fell right over her. <laughs> And he said to her, what are you doing? And she said, I think I just genuflected. <laughs> and he said, why? And she said, I have no idea. That's what we do before we go in to sit down. <laughs> so one thing that I try to do with our Catholics is to educate them why we do what we do. So you don't just go through the actions. The stations of the cross churches traditionally have 14 stations in our cross, in our churches. In the early days, when Christianity was right around Jerusalem and Rome, people tried to make a once-in-your-lifetime pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem and there were places marked that was, was the way of the cross of Jesus. Some of them are biblical and some of them are traditional. But from very early on, people remembered places where things happened, where he fell down with the cross the first time, where the women came out and met him and he <coughs> tried to help him. So when Christianity grew to other parts of the world, you couldn't get back to Jerusalem that easily. So churches began to put those stations on the walls of their church. And then during the season of Lent, the six weeks leading up to Easter, especially on Fridays, the day Jesus died, we will do a ritual prayer where we recount those 14 stations. And we'll walk around in the church, or if there's a lot of people, they'll just kneel in the church, and we read something that talks about what the station is, and we'll sing a song as we walk between them. So a lot of our faith is a procession. Huh? We process around. Again, we use our bodies for that. And to read the stations, they begin here, and go all the way around the church this way like a horseshoe. So you kind of read them backwards, instead of from left to right, from right to left. And they end up bringing you back to the altar, because everything should bring us back to Christ. Then the rosary is a tradition that we, is a private prayer. So we don't often do it, like at Mass, we would not do it. The night before somebody's funeral, we often would pray it. Or sometimes before or after Mass, small groups will get together and pray together as a devotion. <laughs>